Hello everybody, it's good to meet you today. This is the first episode of a study uh, in the book of Colossians. Uh, the brethren here and uh, the, the, the ministers asked me to uh, uh, prepare some lessons and to present them as though uh, I would do that in a college classroom. I did uh, teach at Oklahoma Christian University for right at 30 years. And um, at, at that time I had um, um, 45 minutes of lecture time, 50 minutes of a class, but um, I don't have that much time here, and you probably don't have that much time either. So we'll try to keep it within uh, reason and room. Um, uh, first, I would like to tell you that we aren't going to get into the text of uh, Colossians right now. I want to give some background to Colossians and also to the city of Colossae. I would recommend to you to read the book of Colossians as four small chapters. But if you can't read all of it uh, for the next uh, session of this study, if you read about the first 10 verses of chapter 1, and we will delve into those at, uh, at that time. But first, I want to talk uh, to you about some background and some introduction to the book of Colossians. Um, the situation and the circumstances of the letter that Paul, the Apostle Paul wrote to the saints at Colossae. Uh, Colossians is one of the Apostle Paul's prison uh, letters. Uh, sometimes referred to as epistles, but in uh, reality, they are not epistles, they are letters uh, written after the Greek form of uh, letter writing. Uh, the prison epistles were, were uh, written by Paul while he was in prison at Rome. Um, he uh, was incarcerated several times, but uh, we don't know for sure how many. We do know, however, that uh, we are told at the end of the book of Acts, at chapter 28, that Paul made it to Rome after having appealed uh, to Caesar uh, from the governor uh, of Palestine or the province of Judea. And uh, he did make that uh, uh, hazardous journey across the Mediterranean Sea to Rome. And when he got to Rome, uh, the 28th chapter of Acts tells us that he was given uh, good accommodations and people could come and interact with him. And so from that account in Acts, we know that uh, he was uh, at the beginning and from the start in Rome in prison. However, there are some scholars who uh, think that Paul may have uh, not remained in prison, but was released and then came back and was arrested again. I think that's speculation. I don't think we have anything in Scripture really to uh, base that upon. I just mentioned it in passing uh, because sometimes uh, it, it is brought up. But um, at the time of the writing of the letter to Colossae, uh, he was in prison, and it seems to be that uh, his uh, time in prison at the beginning is now different at this point uh, in his life. Uh, he is waiting to be executed, and it is from this same place that he wrote the second Timothy letter, asking Timothy to come to him before winter before um, navigation was ceased on the Mediterranean Sea and had to come over land. And it is also in that passage that uh, he uh, said some good things about having finished the course. There's some things we'd like to know uh, about uh, writing of all of his prison epistles that we, we don't know, but uh, we know that he was in prison and that he was awaiting uh, execution. Uh, he says in that letter to Timothy that I mentioned that uh, that famous statement that I have uh, fought the good fight, I've finished the race, I've kept the faith. Uh, henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me at that day, and not to me only, but to all those who have loved his appearing. Uh, so uh, we, we know that uh, Paul was in prison, and this is one of his prison epistles. Next, uh, we want to notice that uh, Paul is not alone. Certainly the Lord is with him, as he always has been, but he speaks of his fellow prisoners. And he also talks about uh, those in Rome who are with him that are, are not in prison. Uh, he had privileges in the, in the um, imprisonment is recorded in the 28th chapter of Acts, but now we don't know for sure. We do know that Luke is with him, and Paul refers to him as uh, Luke the, the, the physician, and it is sort of comforting to me that Paul had his doctor with him during the last days of his life. Uh, secondly, I want to look to, with you at some, um, 
significant aspects of Paul's letter to the church at Colossae. He writes to encourage the Christians at Colossae in their relationship with Christ and with their, their relationship with each other. And when we begin to discuss uh, aspects of the text itself, uh, we'll notice that those are two significant uh, joinings together. He was impressed by the reports that he had received about the church at Colossae, and he says that he prays to them all the time and mentions them in prayer. He commended them for their faithfulness to Christ as the Lord, and he commended them for the fact that they were united, unified in the Lord uh, himself. Also, secondly, Paul wrote to them about some erroneous teachings uh, that uh, the Colossian Christians were facing. Some of these teachings were by Judaizing teachers. Uh, Judaizing teachers were Jewish people who had become believers in Jesus, but who still held to the law, and who were teaching uh, a Judaizing teaching, which is that uh, they were teaching that Gentiles must first keep the law of Moses before they be could become Christians. Now, there had been a great discussion about this, and uh, we have an account of that in the 15th chapter of Acts, where there was a council held in Jerusalem, and that was uh, uh, set aside as something that should not be bound upon Gentiles, because the law is out of place, the set aside is fulfilled, and now we have the gospel. A second group of people that uh, seems to be uh, active in and around Ephesus as Paul, uh, or Colossae as Paul writes this letter, uh, were the Gnostics. The Gnostics were a group of people that uh, were just beginning to challenge Christianity uh, when Paul wrote this letter to the church at Colossae. Now, in the second century, uh, Gnosticism bloomed into a full-blown uh, movement, and had it not been for the providence of God, it could have easily, very likely, destroyed Christianity, but in the providence of God, that did not and would not happen. The Apostle John, in his letter of 1 John, also says some things that uh, seem to be indicated uh, that uh, the, uh, Gnosticism was uh, also uh, making, gaining ground, and he wrote some things that seemed to be uh, against that particular viewpoint. But we'll deal with those things as we move through the text and come to that part that would be germane to that. Then again, Paul states some significant items about Christianity that are found only in this letter. The book of Colossians, folks, is a really, really unique letter that the Apostle Paul wrote. There are some things in the letter to the saints at Colossae that are not contained in any other book in the Bible. And so some of those significant things are, uh, is that the, the uh, detailing of some of the wonderful blessings that people have who are Christians who are in Christ Jesus. He speaks in one place that we'll talk about somewhat at length later, about God qualifying uh, people to be a able to inherit with the saints in light now that's a mouthful, and uh, I hope that you'll read that first chapter, uh, because when we get to that, it is a uh, it is a mind-boggling thing, the way Paul states that God, by certain things that God has done in Jesus Christ, uh, has qualified us to be inheritors with the saints in light. That would mean otherwise that we are disqualified until God acts. He also shows that. Um, being in the kingdom of uh, God is a transfer from the kingdom of darkness. And with it comes uh, the, the forgiveness of sin because of the blood of Christ. The apostle reveals some special attributes about Jesus as uh, Messiah. In him is the total perfection of the deity of heaven. And in Jesus dwells the fullness of all the God of heaven in bodily form. And when we get to that, we will uh, slow down and talk about it in more detail. In my classes at Oklahoma Christian, uh, I would sometimes um, uh, get to a point like that, and uh, we would take up the rest of the time. Don't know how that'll be. Uh, I'm trying to refrain from one of the things my students knew about me is uh, my corny jokes. Um, but I may have some of those with, uh, that I can't stop, but... I'll try to avoid as much of that as I can. Anyway, he talks about Jesus as the Son of God, 
uh, and uh, that God has in Jesus then as his son revealed the mystery that God held uh, uh, un unrevealed for centuries. And so he shows how the order of things in heaven and on earth uh, coalesce uh, in Jesus Christ. Paul states some practical applications of Christianity as, as well. Uh, he would not, he did not state it in just this way, but what he says is that the law of Moses has been fulfilled and that Jesus has, has nailed it to the cross with himself and that uh, it would be a mistake for the Jewish believers uh, to try to uh, cause the Gentiles uh, to become, as it were, uh, in effect, become uh, Jews before they, they could become Christians. Uh, he uh, sets, us, uh, sets forth some of the interesting things about Jesus being raised. And it's in this context, in the second chapter, that he talks about a baptism, and that it is uh, uh, coming out of that baptism, out of that immersion, being raised with Christ. And here in that part, and we'll spend some time on this when we get to it, uh, Paul talks about the new uh, sign that uh, is the sign of covenant between God and his people now. In the Old Testament, the sign of the covenant was the circumcision of male members of the, of the, of the tribe. But in the New Testament, Paul says, uh, since we've set aside the law of Moses, then we have a different sign that is the seal of um, covenant relationship. It is a circumcision of the heart an excising of our sins, and symbolized by the sign of baptism. Now, that's just a brief look at something we'll spend almost a whole session on uh, later on when, when we get uh, into uh, the text. Then Paul's purpose for writing to the Church of Colossae uh, is important. What was his purpose? What was his aim? It is fairly clear, as far as we know, as far as we know Paul never went to Colossae. He says that they had never seen his face. And so if he did go to Colossae, uh, then uh, it was after he uh, had written this letter uh, to them. So as far as we know, he never did go there. Um, yet there was a believer in Rome uh, that had brought Paul the information from the Christians at, uh, at Colossae, the Colossian Christians. And we know his name is Epaphras. And uh, he had been... Uh, with Paul, or was with Paul, in, in uh, Rome while he was in prison. So the purpose of Paul, uh, as he sends this letter, is clear. Uh, it is to declare the all-sufficiency of Christ, all-sufficient for our faith and for living a godly life. Now then, there are some sources on, on this particular thing, uh, uh, that I want to mention as we go along with this one today uh, is a book written by William Barclay, a great English scholar who was uh, just magnificent in, with word studies. Uh, and uh, it, it is in his uh, uh, book, The All-Sufficiency of Christ, that uh, the idea that Paul sets forth in the letter to uh, the Colossians is that uh, there isn't anything else that is possible to be needed other than the sufficient sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. That would be an, an era aimed at the Gnostics, if uh, not anybody else. But that is something that we will want to spend some time with as we move forward into the text. Also, in this idea of Christ being preeminent, uh, it is, the, is the fact of Christ's preexistence. Uh, he, uh, when he was born as the babe of Bethlehem, did not, uh, that was not the beginning or the origin of him. Uh, he was preexistent as an eternal being, and as a matter of fact, Paul states here, as other, others do elsewhere, that uh, Jesus Christ was the power in heaven as part of the Godhead that the Godhead uh, used as the uh, instrumentality to create the universe. So Paul uh, dwells upon that, and that's, uh, that is based upon and a part of the, the theme and the reason for writing to the Church of Colossae. 
uh, to show that Jesus Christ is preeminent and before uh, everything else. Well, just uh, uh, for a few minutes now before we go, um, I want to talk to you a minute about the city of Colossae and the church in Colossae. Two things, the city of Colossae first. Colossae was located in the valley of the Lacus River, uh, which was a tributary of the Meander River. And that river, the Meander River, uh, flowed and emptied into the sea at Ephesus. Ephesus is uh, in a, a, a beautiful ruin uh, today in what is modern day Turkey. Um, it was located near the cities of Laodicea and Areopolis. Uh, these three cities were set in a, in a triangle about 125 miles uh, east of Ephesus. They were all, all three were on a highway kind of connected as a triangle on a highway that led to the, that, to the junction of the road that goes to Sar Sardis and Pergamum, two of the letters of the, uh, the churches of Asia to which John uh, is addressing a letter in Revelation. Uh, Paul's evangel method of evangelism was to plant gospel in places where it would travel down main arteries uh, uh, of trade and communication and make its greater impact in the area into which it was going. This is a significant point because of the information that we have in chapter eight, uh, 19 of Acts that Paul was, Paul's teaching about Christ reached all of Asia. And this would be the way that it did it, uh, a strategic location just to the east of Ephesus where he spent nearly three years uh, teaching in the school of Tyrannus and uh, that it was from there that all the rest of Asia received an, uh, an understanding and a conversion uh, by the gospel. Uh, Colossae's population was varied, although it was primarily a Gentile city, and uh, there were there Greek people there, and Jewish people as well, a pretty good-sized Jewish uh, uh, colony. Uh, the area was notorious for earthquakes, and uh, it was uh, had two uh, main sources of commercial importance, one was the production of wool and high-quality woolen clothing, and the second was dyeing of, of uh, cloth. Uh, the chalky waters of the Lacus River, it is said, uh, contained a substance particularly adapted to, to coloring clothes or, or materials. In fact, there was one dye that was named the Colossae dye. Then let's look at a moment at the church at Colossae. Paul did not found that church, of course, because uh, he had not been there. Uh, he uh, sent one of the most important letters that he wrote to probably the smallest church and likely the smallest town uh, to which he addressed a letter. There's every likelihood that as a result of Paul's teaching at the lecture hall of Tyrannus uh, in chapter 19, that all of these things moved to the east and, uh, and so that the, the church at Colossae was established. Um, as, as I've just stated, it was uh, uh, at Colossae, uh, mainly a Gentile church, and Paul uses that designation in chapter 1, verse 21. There was heresy, as I've mentioned, at the, in the church at Colossae, a teaching that went counter uh, to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul speaks to what has become known among scholars as the Colossian heresy. And we will expound upon that as we move again into the letter. Uh, it was a, a heresy that denied the all-sufficiency of Christ and the supremacy or preeminence of him. And so, again, it uh, seems like he's writing to counter uh, the teaching uh, of, of the Gnostics. Uh, there was also a philosophical element of heresy at uh, Colossae. Paul warns them about uh, being taken captive against uh, by vain philosophy. And so there was also then, that usually goes along, some uh, observance of uh, rituals and special days and maybe even some worship uh, of the heavenly bodies. Uh, so we, we mentioned the two main groups that he seems to be uh, putting the index finger on the Gnostics and the Judaizing teacher. The Colossian letter now, as we come to the end of our study for today, is a letter of practical application. The Apostle Paul makes pract practical application of what it means to follow Jesus Christ, uh, who is the image 
of the God incarnate. Uh, he transforms the lives of people as they come to God in Jesus Christ. And uh, the deepest and the deepening relationship with God uh, in Jesus Christ impacts everything. It, uh, Paul later will talk in the letter about the transformation that happens to a person that becomes a Christian, that he takes off the old self, like taking off a garment, and puts on a new self, uh, which is a relationship with Christ and all the other people who have that relationship with Christ. Uh, there uh, are specific instructions about uh, uh, the Colossian Christians and their family situation. I call it domestic teaching of the Apostle Paul, that they were steadfast in prayer and that they remained steadfast in prayer. Paul ends with a greeting in the letter, at the end of the letter, uh, in the fourth chapter, to various people in Colossae. And as I say, this is just a background introduction to this wonderful letter that Paul wrote to that very special people and that he calls the saints in Colossae. Next time, we will begin with the text. So I urge you to read the first part, or at least the first half of the book, first chapter, uh, if not the entirety of the book of Colossians. God bless you and keep you and guide you into a greater understanding of the truth as it is in Jesus Christ. Good day.